Hi everybody, welcome to class and the syllabus uh, explanation. So uh, first of all, I'm glad you guys are in class. We're all together and uh, welcome. So we're studying ancient world history all the way up to 1650. That is an amazing range, an impossibility to cover in one semester. <laughs> but that's a wonderful problem. It's almost like you are walking up to a massive, massive, a buffet of the best kind of food. All right, some buffets buffets not that nice. Depends what kind of level of buffet you go into, as you guys know, right? This it's kind of low end buffets, middle end, some high end. So this class, it's the best of all high end buffets, full of all kinds of gourmet food and variety after variety after variety from all over the world. That's what we're doing together uh, in history of four A. So it's gonna be a wonderful semester. Really glad to have you guys in class, and uh, let's jump into it. So we start off with a quote by Machiavelli, and Machiavelli is that gentleman right here on the left. Machiavelli writes, whoever wishes to foresee the future must consult the past. Are human events ever resemble those of preceding times? This arises from the fact that they are produced by men and women who ever have been, ever shall be, animated by the same passions, and thus they necessarily have the same results. Now, I'll be careful here. I'm not saying, and I don't think Machiavelli, well, I don't want to speak for him, is saying history is just cyclical, it's just a circle. If you study the past, you know exactly what's going to happen. I just don't say that's not true. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. Nobody does. If they, if they did, historians would probably not be having teaching jobs. They'd be playing the stock market all the time and living in some amazing villa somewhere off the Italian coast. <laughs> but I think what Machiavelli is saying, and I would agree with this too, is uh, that human nature throughout time has not changed. So our our perceptions, our self-focus, our desires, our passions, our fears, the best and worst humanity, that remains the same. So although technology has changed immensely around us, our knowledge of the universe has expanded exponentially from the ancient world, we are not smarter than they are. Now, we know a lot more, but there's not knowledge of not necessarily mean wisdom. <laughs> As you guys probably know, right? Knowledge and wisdom sometimes go together, but it does not mean they're the same. We have many examples of brilliant people doing really dumb stuff. <laughs> uh, so the human challenge of living in this world has not gotten any easier of us coping love, losses, jealousy, passions, hopes, ambitions the dark side of human nature, that's all the same. That's what Machiavelli is talking about. So he's suggesting studying the past gives us insight into why we feel the way we are, gives in insight into the nature of reality around us, and gives insight to how things may, I'll put a big may, may play out as we go forward based on our knowledge of the human condition. Even though, again, history is that things happen, unpredictable things beyond our scope as humanity understand what's going to happen in the future. But it gives us a much better chance of knowledgeably making decisions, um, being informed and knowing the context of the story. Okay. You want to know who is the beautiful young lady on the right? Uh, that is the personification of one of the Greek muses. Uh, the Greek muses is kind of inspiration by the arts and the classical Greek world as they perceive it. Of course, not they're not muses, not real people. It's a kind of feminine interpretation or a, or male interpretation. I'm not sure how the origin of that, but uh, that these inspiration for the arts and music and poetry and history and sculpture and all that uh, have these kind of female personifications. And this would be Calliope, the Greek goddess of eloquent speech and epic poetry. And why do I have her there? Because there's a wonderful quote from Homer's The Odyssey. Uh, and I'll come back to her in just a minute. But this quote by Homer's The Odyssey says, Men and women, we'll say humanity, are so quick to blame the gods. They say that we devise their misery. But they themselves and their depravity design greater griefs than the griefs that fate assigns. So I wonder if poetry is to break that down. That is the god, the Greek gods, of course defending themselves, saying humanity likes to blame us when things go south for them, when things go badly for them. They say, like, I couldn't help but the gods did this. And this is the Greek gods saying, like, look, yeah, we may do some negative stuff, 
but it's usually humanity making their own choices, thinking they know what they're doing that leads to these dark outcomes. They can't blame on some divine forces a lot of the time. It's their own will. It's their own desire to have things their way that ends up turning out badly. And so they should not excuse themselves or responsibility to make wise choices as they navigate this world, navigate life, and just blame it on us when things go south. But many times it's their own choices the way they perceive things, that that has led to disaster for them. What does have to do with Kalu? This Greek goddess of eloquent speech and poetry, because according to Greek belief, legend, uh, she's inspiration who's guiding Homer as he's writing that classic, The Odyssey. So, and there's a piece of wisdom coming down. And I, argue, I like this quote, that's why I chose it for you guys, because it reminds me of you and I have agency. Whatever your spiritual perceptions of, of the large spiritual world, um, and those may be very important and very impactful, that's certainly true, but humanity doesn't have a lot of control of what's going on up there, whether you believe in up there or not, right? But we, what, what control we have is what, what I'm up to. Now, again, I might need spiritual help with that too. <laughs> but uh, whatever your perceptions are, but my ability to interact, my decisions, my choices, what I choose to do, plays a great deal in how things turn out for me, those I love and those around me. I'm not saying there's not some spiritual forces as, as a person of faith myself. I believe that. But I, I love that quote from Homer in which he's saying, but what, what am I up to? What is my role, decisions I make? How do I treat my loved ones and my neighbors and, and my family and my my spouse or my kids? Or how, do, how am I as a human being? What's going on with me <laughs> as a human being? Am I awake in a little world a little brighter because I'm here or a little darker because I'm here? What's going on with me? I don't want to just blame, you know, the supernatural God or gods or whatever. Uh, what's going on with me and take responsibility for my agency to make decisions in this in this life, in this world. Okay. By the way, these questions are so wonderful because that's that's the point, right? Both of these are ancient. Uh, Machiavelli lived in Italy in the medieval world. Uh Homer lived, boy, and we, well, this Homer's a real person or not, but we're talking Dark Ages, ancient Greece. If he was a real person, maybe 900, 1000 BC, we're not really sure, frankly, we just don't know. But the wisdom is still profound and equally applies to us right now today. Two more brief quotes, just talking about just this, the wisdom we have access to the ancient world. By the way, I'm not just focusing on Greece because, but, but Greece has played a huge role in the Western world, but certainly that's true. Uh, of Confucius in Asia, or the Buddha, or Muhammad in, in the world of Islam, and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, okay, so a couple of quotes here. This is by Pericles, the great Athenian uh, leader. And I like this a lot because it's a reminder of, uh, for you guys and for me too, of a wonderful quote there where he says, uh, just because you do not take interest in politics doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. <laughs> Translation. You know, a lot of you guys, you know, you're busy with your career, where you want to go, family, friends, all things going on. You know, you're not paying much attention to the news. And maybe if you do, it seems kind of depressing. And I understand all that. But Pericles is like, but yes, but you're a citizen in a, in a democracy. And uh, although all of ours, my voice too, is very, very small <laughs> in that massive democracy. But our role is important nonetheless, despite it being very small. And Pericles saying... Uh, don't live naively. Don't live naively like I don't have to participate. I don't have to think. I don't have to understand what's going on around me. I don't have to have a voice in here. Because because the system around you affects you. So even though, of course, our voice is quite small, the Pericles is like, be smart. Do your part. Small though it may be, but be a good citizen. Be a, a thriving part of that democracy. Again, as small as our voice is, to make the, our democracy better, to protect our democracy. Don't presume it functions smoothly without your involvement and you're just keeping your fingers crossed, hoping things turn out good. <laughs> Pericles is like, don't be so sure. Maybe you'll be in a minority community someday. And I'm not talking about just race, although it could be race, of course, too. But it could be a minority idea, a minority thought, a minority spiritual system a minority political party, et cetera, et cetera. Don't think that uh, that, that just the society, the majority of society around you is always going to be sensitive to your individual rights. 
They may not be. And history says oftentimes they are not. So Pericles is like, we need you. Your democracy needs, and even if you're not that interested in your fellow man, which hopefully you are, of course, but even for your own self-protection for those you and you love, our need to be educated citizens and democracy is critical. And Pericles is warning us from all these years of what can happen if we don't. And then something quite different, but uh, my quote I love by the Greek orator, thinker, uh, statesman Demosthenes. Demosthenes says something that is a truism of just about, I'd argue about life, and that is that nothing is easier than self-deceit. For what each man or woman wishes that he, she also believes to be true. Now, this is a wonderful piece of wisdom from the ancient world. Now, we're not drawing a lot of technology directly from them in, in our time period today, but certainly we can benefit from their wisdom. Demosthenes is warning us, saying, like, look, the human mind is a powerful, powerful tool. That's why when you guys are in college, you're working on that tool right here, right? You guys are investing in that, investing in your career, investing in giving you more mental tools and experiences beyond the scope of what you have in your education so far. And hopefully this class will do more of that. But Demosthenes is saying, but the human mind is so likely to categorize evidence to back up what it wants to believe is true. Not interested in larger truth or reality, but instead constructing and labeling evidence that backs up what I want to already believe. And it's evidence that's contrary to what I want to believe, I dismiss it. And of course, obviously that's dangerous because we would hope that humanity, and that'd be our quest too, is to see reality clearly, not filtered through my bias of what I want to be true. But man, that is hard for all of us, it's hard for me. Because we all have passions, things we want desperately to be true. And so we're so hoping that evidence accumulates that supports what we want to be true the not democracy is like but be careful of course that's natural of course it's human to have your favorites and things you want to have happen of course it is but we want above all to be clear-eyed about reality and that means when sometimes when data comes in against my pet theory against my heart's wishes i listen to that too as painful and dislocating as that can be, but I've got to hear it because it's true. And reality, sooner or later, is either going to be my friend or going to cause me pain. And so Demosthenes is warning us, encouraging us, see clearly, don't allow our political or worldview or personal wishes dilute our ability to understand and see clearly. All right, by the way, I'm not going too much longer. We're going to jump into the bread and butter of this uh, class here in a minute. I just want to give you guys a framing for what we're doing in this class and the importance of, uh, of the ancient world to inform us, to educate us, grant us greater depth, and at its best, hopefully, work on our character and our, our perceptions and moral sense, and ethical sense, and artistic sense, and all that stuff. All right, last two examples of this. I really like this. Uh, in front of the U.S. Supreme Court in building in Washington, D.C., there is two very large statues, one on the left of the building, one on the right of the building, by the very talented American sculptor James Earl Frazier. The one on the left, which you see right here, is a depiction of what he calls contemplation of justice. In this case, the form of a, a woman, and she's in deep thought, sitting calmly, and in her right hand, she see she's holding something. She's holding the small statue of justice, which is blindfolded. As you guys know, the phrase justice is blind, and the she's in deep thought is what is the correct thing. I don't know about you guys, being in the Supreme Court, being very flat or a very difficult job. Was what, is, what is the wisest thing? What is the correct thing in the Constitution? How do you interpret, interpret that document? What do you do with that? And the effect upon millions and millions of Americans, in this case, 330 million American lives, and maybe more beyond that, uh, the, the weight of responsibility of that is so heavy. And again, that's symbolically, again, drawn from the ancient Greek world in this case, of, of justice and contemplation, uh, to think carefully with deep wisdom and experience to make the right decision. Now, on the right, you have this statue by the same brilliant sculptor, and it's called the Authority of the Law. And that's him depicted right there. And he's holding up a tablet. The tablet has Latin word lex, 
which was Latin for the law. And of course, in the case of our nation, the law in general, but the Constitution is specific. But again, draw around imagery from ancient Greece and from Rome, Rome as well. It's actually Lex is Latin, so that's a Roman imagery as well, too. But channeling the best of the experience of the ancient world as we navigate our contemporary world today. Drawing inspiration, but also warning, because the ancients made mistakes, they did things wisely, and hopefully you and I can profit from that by avoiding the errors they made, but profiting from the the genius that they contain as well, too, if we read carefully and think carefully. All right. Now, I'll take a breath, get a drink. And we go shortly get into the very practical aspects of our class. So, uh, so here's some of the great stories in the past. On the left, we have Rodotus, the father of history in the Western world. Um, Sima Quinn, that is a, the godfather of Chinese history. And that gentleman on the right is the, one of the godfathers of history in the Islamic world, Ibn Khaldun. All right. So after all that prelude to get us, <laughs> get us salivating for this class, I hope, um, let's get down to the practical details. So I'm Michael Lorenz, professor of history. I've been here at the college for quite a few years. It's my pleasure to hang out with you guys. Um, where am I located? This would be in my office. I'm in the IEC building, social science room 219. I know you guys are taking an online class, but if you guys are on campus, I'd love to see you guys drop by. Come on my office hours. We can talk a little bit. I can help you. We can simply discuss things in class, something on your mind. I really like that for you guys to drop by and so I can see you guys in 3D. There's my office phone number and there's my office email. Great way to get a hold of me, office email. There are my office hours. So Monday, Wednesday from 11 to 11.50, I'm in my office. Um, and I'll be right here. It's a little crap space right here with all my books, <laughs> some art, other things got in here. And then, uh, but of course, you guys may not be, might be on campus at all, depending on your schedule and what you guys have selected for this semester. But my Zoom office hours are Tuesday, 11 to 2. So hopefully that can work for you guys as well, too. Office hours, that means my Zoom office hours. I'll provide you the Zoom ID number in, Can in Canvas. That way we can still talk uh, remotely as well, too. All right, our class dates, August 14 to finals week, December 11 to 15. And uh, require books for our class. You'll need two books. I went to get them. <laughs> You're going to need uh, the human record. Well, yours look something different like the one you get see on the screen in front of you. And you'll need uh, Augustus, the life of Rome's first emperor. And uh, you guys will enjoy that. There's Augustus right there from his most iconic statue, uh, probably his, his Facebook. <laughs> I guess Facebook's getting kind of old, but whatever his, whatever your social media platform you're using, that would be, probably be his, because he sure looks good there. It's a very talented sculpt. It's probably photoshopped him a little bit to make him look uh, an amazing, imposing military commander there. So those are the two books we need for class. The first one is a collection of primary sources. The second one is a biography, if you guessed it, Augustus Caesar, or Caesar Augustus. You guys will really enjoy this book, by the way. Um, actually, both books. But Augustus Caesar's life is fascinating. It's never-ending drama. It's a great uh, dive into the ancient Roman world. Um, boy, you can enjoy it. <laughs> uh, he, when he, by the way, when he begins to really struggle for power, he's your guy's age. So it's not like, he, yeah, just it's pretty amazing. So when he's really coming to grips with his ascent to power, and it'd be not an easy ascent, by the way. A lot of ups and downs, roller coaster rides of, of triumph and then disaster and then triumph. And just, yeah, it sounds like a novel. Uh, but he's your guy's age when that really kicks off and gets going. And he gets into the very dangerous world of Roman politics and how that plays out. And the book on the left is full of primary sources from the ancient world up to 1650. You guys really enjoy that too, because that gives us direct access to, with no middleman, to read from directly the word for word from ancient authors all the way to 1650. Be powerful. You guys enjoy that too. All right. So you guys know most of this already, so I'm not going to spend time. Obviously, you guys are using Canvas. A Zoom will be when we have office hours, if that works for you. Uh, I think maybe I will fast forward past that James Baldwin quote, even though I love it in James Baldwin. I give you such a long preview already, I don't want to bog down too much on this, although 
I don't think he ever bogged down and talked about James Baldwin, but uh, maybe I'll just briefly mention it. It's a quote, he writes, history does not refer merely nor principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes the fact we carry within us. We're unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. So I love that quote so much. Probably my, not probably, is my single favorite quote from any writer or intellectual talking about the impact and importance of history. And why is that? Because Baldwin's saying it's not past at all. The way we look at the world, even the way I, I, I perceive reality around me is chock full of, when I say history, I don't mean facts and dates, but ideas, perceptions, values. All that has been downloaded here through education, through reading, entertainment, family, community, church, nation travel, you name it, has been downloaded here. I would like to imagine that I'm a thinking person. I'd like to imagine that I'm unique and, and creative and so forth. But uh, if I come up with like 0.5% unique original thought, <laughs> um, that would be all I could ask for. Because in reality, I'm regurgitating uh, the human experience from the last um, we got, it's about 4,000 years of recorded history, even farther back than that. So when it comes to my taste in art, morality, sports, <laughs> uh, architecture, government, religion, you name it. Um, I can't claim any of those as my specialty, I guess, in a sense. You know, we, we download it. And what Baldwin is saying, that, that's fine. That's not, that's not a bad thing, by the way. I think Baldwin said it's not bad. But you want to be a knowledgeable consumer of the index card of, of knowledge and idea and values we have in our own head. That way we can do that fully awake. Instead of almost like, I think Baldwin uh, said, almost like zombie-like walking away through life with all these thoughts completely unexamined. Uh, no, no really individual decisions made about them. That we simply reflexively live almost robotically on the accumulation of others' ideas that we, aware of this backstory, are able to take some deep breaths and make more conscious choices based on what we think is best for us and for those around us and for those that love us. Um, and, and knowledge of history helps us do that. So why do I think this way? Oh, because they thought this way. Okay, again, that could be good. Again, Balls will not say this is a negative thing, but I think you would say it's negative if we live zombie-like in ignorance is we have no ability to step outside of our culture, the microcosm of our family, of our community, and take some deep breaths and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's really happening here? What is the reality really taking place there? I want to get out of the herd for a minute, the herd of lemmings of society all doing this thing, but let me, let me take a deep breath here and think for a minute about what's really taking place here. And we need more of our citizens and you and I to do that. So, all right, I'm going to go fast forward through this stuff right here. Um, it's important, but kind of give us the kind of background. But I think I've done a pretty good job describing what we're working on. So, let's get down to uh, what you do for class, which you guys have been waiting probably for the whole time. So, let's get to that right now. So, what do you guys need to do for class practically? So, uh, we'll have Canvas discussions in this class. You're probably familiar with those. If you're not, you'll see them in modules because, of course, we rely on modules to go through all this. I've made the whole semester into individual weeks. That's how much structured, which makes sense, right? Now, the nice of the week is it gives you some flexibility within the week of when you do the readings, when you watch the lectures and take notes, and when you do the assignments, because it's based on these weeks. Now, just make sure you check the date, due dates for assignments, though. So keep up with all the weekly activities. But again, within that week, you can decide, like, when you're going to read, when you're going to watch the lectures. Just make sure, obviously, if there's a due date for a specific assignment due that week, Make sure you pay attention to that due date. But the week itself is structured as you guys wish, right? So I don't assign, like, on this day you're doing this meeting. No. Within that week, you need to do it, but you have complete flexibility within that week to choose when you choose to do it. All right. And we'll have uh, discussions. Second part, we'll have, uh, as you're reading, you're going to do an assignment that accompanies all the readings. So every time you guys read a chapter in Anthony Everett's Augustus, or 
actually not four. And every time you read an individual primary source here in your other textbook, you're going to find two quotes from that chapter or specific primary source in your other textbook, this guy here. And you're going to use those two quotes. You can write those two quotes down on a, a Word document. The first quote, you describe why that quote is significant to the story or why is it significant to you. So you'll write the quote down that you found. Again, you'll just select the quote from the reading that appeals to you. You'll write that quote down and you explain the significance of that quote. You'll find a second quote. For this one, you'll, again, you'll write that quote down then describe a question that that quote naturally prompted. Like maybe something takes place in the story about Augustus. You don't understand, like, why would he have done this? You come across some quote that really, like, it's challenging you, like, I don't understand, it's perfect. Write that quote down and follow up the question based on that quote. Now, there's more to it. I don't want to get you guys confused. I'm going to make a special video just specifically how to do this assignment called Response to Readings Direct Quote Analysis, which is what I just tried to very briefly describe to you guys. It's not hard. It's quite simple and easy to do. But I want to make a separate video because I don't want to go into a 15-minute explanation of exactly how to do this here. But in a separate video, I will show you exactly how to do this. Again, it's not hard. It's easy to do. It's just simply something you do as you read your signed readings. It's an assignment that goes with the readings. Okay, that's enough of that. All right, you also have videos you guys go watch your class, documentaries you guys watch your class, and even a movie. Um, so uh, when you're doing that, uh, you'll respond to those naturally, and you'll uh, upload your response there in Canvas in the module when you see it due. At the end of the semester, we'll do a, a critical analysis paper or a paper that'll be based on Augustus by Anthony Everett and based on the human record. Excuse me. <laughs> be based on those two books. And that'll be due at the end of the semester. And finally, uh, there are four objective exams, and exams are based entirely upon the lectures. So every week, you'll see typically the start of the week, you'll see the dates for that week. It'll be like week two. And the first thing will be your reading for that week, and then your response questions, which I just talked about briefly. You do those two things. You'll read the assignments, you'll take some quotes, respond to them. Then the other things you'll do in that week is you'll have lectures. The typical week, you have two or three lectures. Now, when you're watching the lecture, take good notes. The nice thing about an online lecture, right, is you can pause it when you need to. Uh, my lectures, I'll be lecturing verbally, but also you'll have a Word document scrolling in front of you. So whenever you come across something I stress is really important, you can simply pause the lecture and then write down, take notes on what you just saw there. Now, if I don't, um, if I don't tell you this is important and it's not highlighted, you probably don't need to write it down. So typically in the lecture, I'll try to give you, I'll tip my hat by just saying like this is really important, or I'll, I'll outright highlight it to try to help you guys figure out what exactly should you write down and what can you just listen to but you don't need to write down because you'll see kind of both kinds in my notes. My notes are kind of extensive, but some sections you don't need to write down, frankly. You can just listen to the context, give you part of the backstory. But other sections are really important. You want to write them down because that'll be on the exam. So the exams are based entirely on my lecture notes. So if you take good notes, when the exam comes up, uh, those notes can be used on the exams. So the wonderful thing is the exams are open note. So A, you'll study the note. As you're writing your notes, you'll be better, more likely to remember what's going on. Before the exam opens up, you guys can read through your notes. And then the exam itself, you can have your notes ready to go. So again, if you're studying ahead of time, when the exam starts, you'll know some answers right away. But if you don't, you have your notes right there, right? And so you can immediately go to, oh, I remember that's in ancient Greece. Who is this guy? Oh, that's right. That's Seneca or, you know, whoever that is. Actually, Seneca is Roman. I guess it's ancient Greece. Maybe that would be Cleisthenes for ancient Greece and, and democracy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying. So take good notes. One last thing I'll say about the lectures. Now, you guys know yourself. If you, well, the, the typical lecture is about an hour. The nice thing is they're recorded, right? So you guys know yourself. If you want to do 20 minutes taking notes and then you need that little break, perfect, right? Pause. <laughs> Go get something to drink, get a mocha, uh, take the dog for a walk, <laughs> decompress for a little while, whatever, right? And then you come back to it, right? Now, some of you guys will just knock it out an hour straight through just taking notes. 
So do what works best for your learning style. If you feel you're starting to dig, dig, glaze over a little bit, and my voice is starting to drone, hopefully not, but it might. Then, then you, you know, right, take a break, right? And then you come back to it later on and resume taking good notes, uh, which will be for the exams. All right, so let's get to how the class breaks down. Canvas discussions, about 75 points. Chuck, pretty good side, chuck your grade. Oh, I need to fix this. Well, okay, this should say, and I will fix this. Hold on. I saw a typo in my, my syllabi there, so I just fixed it. So, response to readings, direct quote analysis. That's that, those quotes you guys will, uh, will find and write down and respond to based on the readings you guys have. That's worth 180 points or 26% of your grade. It's a big chunk of your grade. Remember, that's quite easy. You guys will watch the separate video where I explain detail. I also have a sample to show you guys. So if you're not clear based on my very short description of how to do this, don't worry, right? You'll have a complete separate video talking about just how to do that. And I have a sample so you can look at it too, both listen to my video explaining it. And also you can look at the samples to see exactly how to do it. It's not hard, but you'll see it. Uh, Short video responses are worth about 80 points, all of those together. Your final papers with 150, and finally exams, maybe four of them, are worth 200 points. And all that adds up in the points you see right there. And of course, I think about Canvas is as I grade, you guys will see your grade update steadily. So you guys will always know how you're doing. All right, so uh, we don't have too much left here, which is good news you guys can get this wrapped up pretty soon. Uh, class work, late work. So. Late work, I take that on a case-by-case -case basis based on why you uh, could not turn it on time. So just let me know if you had a medical emergency or so forth or similar things. Uh, let me know what's going on. And I, based on what the reason and the explanation, I may let you turn it in late or may not, just depending on what's going on. Um, I tend not to drop students from class. I lean not to do it unless they're just completely not participating in class. Um, so, but I encourage you guys to protect your grades. So if you need to drop, uh, make sure you drop the class. Academic honesty. Oh, this is an important one. <laughs> so, try to give you a short version of this. Um, one of the most recent classes I had, I had a significant number of students who were using AI writing tools, chat GPT, for example, to uh, do the writing for them. That, that got them zeros. I know it's a terrible temptation to use AI writing tools. By the way, I'm not saying AI writing tools don't have a place in society. They do. There's certain things they're good at. But not to replace you in your learning and you responding to something you've studied and thought for. So I need to know what you thought, not what an AI system thought, right? So in a, in a, a class at the college level uh, doing this kind of work, I need to know your writing skill as you're processing I also want to see you processing and synthesizing the information you are digesting from the books or video or whatever it is, not what AI thinks, right? So AI cannot do something that's thinking and writing for you. So that would be a form of cheating or plagiarizing, and that results in a zero. My most, most recent class had a significant number of students who got, got some painful lessons in that. Don't do that. Don't use chat GPT. Same thing, don't go on the internet. Other students go on the internet and they look for papers and they find them, right? Right? You guys know this, right? <laughs> you can find papers. You can find responses online. And it can save you a ton of time. You will, of course, learn nothing and the good chances are you'll get a zero. So don't do that. It's a catastrophic grade. I've had students lose two, a two-letter grade difference. Some worse. Some students went from having a C to failing the class because uh, they were not doing their work. And they're allowing AI writing tools or something going online for other students' work, or copy other students' work, etc. Just do your own work. Do yourself a huge favor. Protect your GPA. Protect your financial aid. And above all, protect this thing, right? You don't want to... There's no shortcuts in true education. Now, there could be some shortcuts, I suppose, at least in the short run, <laughs> by definition, shortcut. That seems to get you right one, but no true education is found through a shortcut where you don't learn. So don't sabotage your grade or your learning. Even if your learning doesn't matter so much, but the grade does, uh, that one, if that's all it takes, okay, then that, that's enough. Uh, protect your grade. We have pretty good software. <laughs> Both 
software on my computer sitting in front of me and pretty good software on here too of sniffing out plagiarized work, work that's not yours, whether that's AI or from internet, other internet sources. So um, for the small percentage of you who that's a temptation, kick that little demon off your shoulder, your writing, no matter how perhaps incomplete or unfinished it is, is still worth a significant amount of points. Using AI writing tools, chat GPT, et cetera, uh, other sources on the internet, cut and paste from the internet, et cetera, that's worth a zero. It's catastrophic grade. Protect yourself. Uh, there's a wonderful extra credit, but I think I'm not going to go into it in this video. I think I'll post a video on extra credit, you guys. But the best are those fabulous mu museums you guys can visit. I'd highly recommend to you guys. Other things you guys can do too for extra credit. Um, videos you can watch for extra credit too. Other things you guys can do. Um, but I think I'll save that for a separate video. Uh, campus Security, if you're on campus, Campus Shield is a free app that Merced College has made available. Now, again, a lot of you guys are not on campus. If that's the case, it won't matter to you. But if you are on campus for other classes, for whatever reason, um, I recommend that Campus Shield app. It's the fastest way to get contact with Merced College Police Department for medical emergencies or safety issues, whatever taking place. Um, most of these next things about classroom behavior were in an online class, so if some of these don't apply to us at all. Uh, the exception would be make sure when we're doing uh, discussions that we're respectful and thoughtful of our fellow students. Uh, their opinions may differ from us, that's fine, but uh, we will make sure that we're thoughtful of the students. We may disagree with their perceptions of the larger world, but respect them as an individual and we treat them with respect. Finally, we're at the end here, American Disability Act. There's all kinds of wonderful services here on campus. Please make use of those. Those are contact numbers there. Same thing for sexual misconduct. We want to make sure our class is safe environment. If you see something that concerns you, please reach out to me, let me know. Uh, we make sure our class always remains a place of learning, a place of enjoyment, and a place of safety uh, where all of us participate or can be fully present and are not taken advantage of, our, of, like, of other students. Some more resources available to you guys further on in the syllabi, all kinds of good resources available, tutoring, all kinds of good things. So please uh, make use of all that stuff. And with that, I think that is enough. <laughs> so uh, welcome to class, everybody. So glad to have all of you guys with us. It's going to be a wonderful semester. And uh, that's enough for right now. We'll see you at the next video. Take care, everybody.